This is Beat Senioritis with the Real Time Network Space Simulation. We appreciate you all coming to our talk today. Um, as mentioned, I'm Michael and this is Brett. And so just a little bit more about us, uh, as, as we got a little uh, introduction uh, before, thank you, uh, Fred, for that. Um, I have my master's in computer science from McGill University. I've also done additional studies in user-centered design and game design. Uh, I've been an engineer at Microsoft since 2008, and I found out about Teals in uh, 2011 and joined there as a volunteer. Uh, so I've been doing that for the last five years uh, in the mornings, uh, going into high school. And uh, as, as mentioned, I um, do some game design discussion videos, uh, and I just started a um, dice game called Cogs and Machine um, and shipped that uh, earlier this year. So I'm pretty, pretty happy that that went through. Good, good project. Uh, hi, I'm Brett. Uh, as Fred said, up until uh, for the last month, I've been the instruction and training manager for the Teals program inside Microsoft. Before that, I was the computer science teacher at Issaquah High School in Issaquah, Washington for about six years. Uh, before that, I was a master's of education student at the University of Washington. Before that, I was a software engineer at Microsoft. Before that, I did an undergrad in computer science at Harvard. And before that, I was in high school. Um, and then uh, while I was at Issaquah, in addition to running the computer science program, I was also the advisor for the FIRST Robotics team uh, there at Issaquah High School. So I spent a lot, a lot of hours doing robotics in addition to computer science. A uh, quick overview of what we're going to take you through today. We already told you a little bit about us. We're going to tell you a little bit about the TEALS program, just to give you some background on how we met and how we do all of this. Then we'll get into the space battle system that we've used in our class for the last five years and how that works. We'll tell you a little bit about the system. We'll tell you a little bit about the curriculum that we've built around it and how we do that. We'll get into the senioritis problem and how we attempt to address it. And then we'll tell you a bit about our students' experiences and show you how you can actually get this started in your own classroom. It's pretty quick and easy. So, uh, Teals, there, you may have heard Teals floating around at the conference all week here. We have a booth downstairs. Um, we are a program housed within and supported by Microsoft. Uh, we like to say that we are a professional development program wrapped in a volunteer program. The, way, the idea here is we help high schools build high quality, sustainable computer science programs by partnering classroom teachers who typically don't have a strong computer science background with industry volunteers like Michael here who do, uh, and together they co-teach computer science classes, uh, typically first period so that the engineers can get off to their normal day jobs afterwards. Uh, we start out in this full co-teach model where the classroom teacher is bringing in the pedagogical expertise and the volunteers are bringing in the subject matter expertise. And the idea is that gradually over time, through both just being in the classroom and from some training we provide, the classroom teachers pick up the content expertise and begin to transition into more and more of the role of actually leading and teaching the class, not just helping with the classroom management and the support things. Uh, and ideally, after about two or three years, we hand it off. The teacher is able to support their classes on their own, and the volunteers will either step back into a TA role, uh, or they'll move into what we call consulting support, where they just pop in every now and then as needed. Uh, or best case scenario, they just step away completely. The classroom teacher's got it under control, and we can repurpose those volunteers to another school that might want to get a program started. Uh, it's a really cool program. We're really proud of it. As Fred said, I was the very first volunteer back in 2010 when I was still an engineer at Microsoft before I became a teacher. Uh, and since then, we've grown quite a bit. We were four schools, about 13 volunteers that year in 2010. For 16, 17, we're going to be in about 270 high schools in 22 states. We expect to have about 850 industry volunteers and reach a total of around 9,000 students. Uh, so it's a really cool program, and we're ha really happy to be a part of it. If you want to know more, we're happy to talk later. Uh, there's a Teals booth downstairs, staffed by our Southern California regional manager. She'd be able to answer any questions, uh, or we can be reached online, or all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. A lot of those volunteers are also not just Microsoft, but in, you know, include Amazon, Google, Facebook, uh, lots of smaller uh, company, you know, startup companies that are in those local areas that we've been growing uh, centers for in Teals as well. So it's really really like expanding. Uh, so we're just going to start with a little highlight video, uh, just kind of go goes through a little bit of what we've been doing the past five years with this platform, kind of get let you see up front a little bit about what we're going to be talking about, uh, and it just kind of points out some of the, the things that it lets you do and, and how it works. We don't have the audio pumped through the room, but... <laughs> And so all the ships you see up here are ships that our students in our class wrote to perform these challenges. Uh, and we'll talk about these various challenges uh, later on as well.
on the double bubble. Double bubble? Yeah, not double. Oh man, we're in Pulling ahead with 70 points. Good break. Quinn <laughs> USS Swag Daddy in a tight match. Oh. Swag Daddy takes the lead with a couple of minutes ago. Welcome everyone who just joined us. You just caught the end of the video, but we'll be talking about all this for the rest of the session. You haven't really missed much, so welcome. Uh, so uh, what you, the video you saw is basically the highlight reel that we just put together of what, you know, showing, showcasing space battle and the different challenges we've done over the last uh, five years. This has basically been the final project we've done for the last month, month and a half of our APCSA uh, curriculum. So, you know, AP exam ends in May. We've got about a month left of school. And so we want to, you know, find, we needed something to fill that gap and really, you know, tie in together all the concepts that the students have learned throughout the year and challenge them. And so that's basically what we started building, uh, mainly as an experiment at first. Uh, and it's just really grown into this platform um, that we'll, we'll share more with you today. So everything that the students do is written in Java because that's what they're learning for the APCSA uh, curriculum. So it's all familiar. They don't have to you know, learn any new programming languages or IDEs. They're just working in the same environment that they have for the whole year. We just challenge them with this new uh, physical, uh, you know, virtually physical environment for them to play in. Um, so everything they're doing, again, built in Java. So there's a couple of libraries. We'll talk a little bit more of that at the end about how you get set up. Uh, the server itself is built in Python, uh, uses a couple of libraries uh, for the graphics, Pygame, and Chipmunk for uh, our simulated physics. So it's a pretty realistic physics environment that these ships are in and that the students have to learn about and, and engage with. Uh, and all of our code for the project is now open source and on GitHub as of a couple years ago, or last year, I think, maybe. Um, so for all the challenges you see here, they're basically templates as an example. So if there's not something that it's currently provided in the system. You can download the source. You can figure out um, how the library works. There's a pretty good interface for all these challenges that we, we uh, kind of competitions that we put together. And so you can basically create your own competitions within this uh, framework as well. Yeah, and just to be clear, and um, we'll get into this a little more later, it's, it's built by engineers for a computer science class, but you don't need any depth of computer science understanding to run this beyond what you would do, uh, what you would need to teach the computer science class. So if you're one of the increasingly many computer science teachers who don't have that strong background in engineering or in software, this is still very approachable for you as the teacher and it should be for your students as well. Yeah, everything's packaged up. Uh, it ships with a whole bunch of these pre-configured com competitions so you can, you know, at, at the simplest just say, I want to run, you know, this competition and set it go. And, yeah. uh, and we'll, we'll show you how all that works a little bit later on. So basically, uh, under the hood, uh, as we mentioned, there's this server machine uh, that we we set up at the at, at the teacher station. So basically, it's you know what you're going to be what you usually use for your class every day that you project up in the front of the classroom. We expect there to be a projector in the class, and so that's where you know the students get access to the space and so all those videos that you saw earlier. That's what the students see in class, uh, and they connect their ship to. Uh, the student's computer requirements really simple. It just has to run Java. So if you've been doing that all year with your class, we don't really need any extra te technical requirements uh, to use this as a project. Yeah, you there, don't need big gaming rigs, heavy-duty hardware, graphics cards, anything like yeah, that. Yeah, everything is done on that uh, server machine at the front of the classroom. So as long as your machine is relatively recent, it shouldn't have any troubles running this. Uh, yeah. Most of the hardware we've been running on it, you know, is 
four or five years, years old. So. I'm going to demo this. When we do this later, I'm going to demo on my Surface Pro 3. So we don't have any specialty hardware here. Yeah. The main thing you'll probably want to do is just reach out to your IT department since it, since it does use the network to communicate between the student and the server machine uh, at the front of the classroom. You know, you might need to open a port, which you might need to be an admin for uh, on the machine. But once you get up and running, you shouldn't have too many troubles. Um, the uh, all that networking stuff is basically ab abstracted by the platform, so students don't need any networking knowledge. They're basically just learning this library interface to control their ship, and then we handle all that technical stuff to make it happen at the front of the classroom uh, where they can engage with each other and get excited about these competitions that we run. So the basic paradigm for the student is basically the server is going to request a command from the ship. So this is calling a method in their code. You know, what do you want to do? It has some information about the environment, the space around them. Uh, we'll get into the details a little bit more about that later. But uh, the student's code basically has to figure out what command it wants to return. It's got the list of commands coming up here, so we'll talk about what ships are capable of doing. And then the server basically just comes back with that command and starts executing it, so their ship will start thrusting, it'll rotate around, it'll fire a torpedo, whatever they have asked it to do, and then this just repeats. So the students have to get used to some other entity besides their own code uh, executing their logic. So in terms of ship commands, there's a lot on here, and you'll find with a lot of this talk, we're going to be mentioning a lot of things that the ships can do, a lot of the competitions that you can run, a lot of the ways you can configure them. There's a lot this system does for you. You do not have to utilize it all at once, of course. Um, it is really built to start at a small uh, pace, and then as your students ramp up to it, as you get used to it, you can expand as much as you need to to specifically target your classroom. Um, so uh, I'll. I'll we're going to be going over a lot of stuff, but just know that you know you start off small. We have this all listed out and broken out on how you can build on it, uh, and you can really pick and choose exactly what you want to target with your classroom. So uh, basic case cap capabilities of your ship, you are able to move around the world. So you have thrusting um, and rotating, so that can get you pointed in the right direction. Break abstracts some of the complex physics, so if you're not moving in the same direction that you're facing, uh, you can kind of just call break to slow down without having to do all that math um, because not all of our students necessarily have taken trigonometry and you know geometry or physics yet so you know they don't necessarily have to have all of those skills to still um, be accessible to this platform. Uh, there's advanced movement commands that we introduce later such as all stop so it just stops them on a dime it's a little bit costly you know hurts your crew a bit but uh, they can do it if they need to. <laughs> Uh, we have steering, which is another way to move uh, without having to deal with rotation and firing specific thrusters. We have warp, so for long distance travel, they can figure out at a greater expense how to move around a little bit more uh, speedily. Uh, we have idling, so if they're not sure what they want their ship to do, they are waiting for something to happen in the world, they can just use this command to kind of just have the server wait for them. Uh, and then we have radar, which is how they actually find out about what's around them in the world. And so that paradigm is one of the more complex topics that we have to introduce to the students because they're executing one thing at a time, radar happens and then comes back, and so now they have to start processing those results, and that's where you can pull in uh, some of those other concepts like searching through lists that you've done earlier in the, the, the year. Uh, we have maintenance commands, so you can repair your ship, you can uh, collect energy from the environment for certain uh, you know, black holes and suns and things that you saw. Uh, we have offensive capabilities and defensive cap capabilities as well, so we have torpedoes and mines, we have cloaking and shielding. At the very end of the video you might have noticed that there was a dragon in the uh, gold circle and one of the ships was sitting there, the dragon was ignoring it because he was cloaked. So there's these uh, advanced capabilities of strategies that students can apply, and it's really interesting to see how different students apply those different you know, abilities of their ships in different ways to uh, complete these uh, competitions. Uh, and then every, so some of the games that you can play, the competitions, have their own special commands uh, for the certain objectives, like picking up things in the world or dropping them or uh, scanning specific objects. Uh, so speaking of all those competitions, uh, again, there's a wide variety of them. There's a lot of them that exist. Um, they're basically all built in different ways to uh, develop different skills within the system or to apply uh, different skills that they've learned throughout the year. Um, and they're all configurable on different levels in terms of difficulty. So you can use you know, ones that we've done typically in the past for more advanced uh, scenarios. You can actually you know, water those down and make them accessible as, a, a, as one of your entry platform competitions. Um, and uh, because of 
the configurability of them and how we built them and you know the breadth of uh, some of the topics you can go in and the commands you can use with your ship, the students can actually have lots of different strategies that are viable to complete these challenges. And so that means you're not going to see a lot of code convergence from students of like they're all trying to do the exact same thing to complete this challenge. They're all going to be working on slightly different ways. They're going to be talking to each other, trying to compare notes and figure out how to you know build their ship. Um, but they're you know they're not necessarily going to be one for one trying to converge yeah. to the same. It place. also means it's not just a race where your strongest students are going to be able to leap out ahead doing the right thing faster, and the rest of them are going to be playing catch up. There's an opportunity for somebody who's not necessarily the strongest coder, but who comes up with a, a more active or more interesting strategy to be able to outdo the stronger coders just by utilizing the universe a little bit better. Yeah, your advanced students are going to you know, be eating up those other available options of commands and be trying to figure out those. And then while that's keeping them busy, you, know, you can be focused on those other students that need some uh, more hands-on attention. Uh, so we've split most of our games into what we call the basic games and the advanced games. It's not actually any distinguishing factor on their complexity or their difficulty. You can make any of these as simple or difficulty as, as difficult as you want, really. Uh, the main distinction is that um, in the basic games case, there is a single abstract base class that you start with uh, that we introduce students to to get started in this environment. And all of these games share that uh, information about scoring and the points and how that works um, in, this, in this class. So you can play any of these games without having to introduce a new concept. Once you get to the advanced games, you have to talk about the specific interface for the game and what that provides the student to, to uh, tackle the challenge. So there's a little bit more ramp up involved in these um, compared to the basic games. So that's what that distinction is. Uh, in terms of what they are, you saw a lot of them in the video. Find the middle is one of our go-to starting points. It's just you know navigate from where you are to the center of the universe so it gets them familiar with um, actually you know, moving around in space in this environment. Uh, Survivor is just about avoiding things and living as long as possible. Um, Dragon's Lair is similar, but throws in some, some more hostile uh, enemies in there. Asteroid Miner is about you know, using your radar, finding asteroids, blowing them up. Uh, combat exercise is similar, but to other ships. So if you wanted to be um, a little bit more you know, head to head, you could do that. Shapes in Space is basically turtle graphics. It ties in uh, well as an introductory activity, especially if you did some turtle graphic exercise earlier in the year. Now they can do it, but now there's no friction, so they have to deal with space. Uh, and then Hungry Hungry Bobbles is about collecting uh, these little trinkets of different values in space, so it's just kind of a scavenger hunt. Uh, the advanced games go into a little bit more details, um, so I won't go <coughs> explicitly into those, but Discovery Quest, I'll call out, because it was a experiment by us last year to do something that was purely by its definition of the game and the competition non-combative, right? So you don't have to use the torpedoes, you don't have to be firing at each other's ships. Um, you can have, uh, you can pick and choose from these challenges and create something that's purely just a objective, you know, challenging environment where the students are challenging themselves and not, you know, having it be this big yeah. space fight. Yeah, we get this question a lot. We call it space battle, but it's not a necessarily a battle or a combat type of simulation. And uh, Michael called out Discovery Quest. All of these games, none of these uh, competitions really incentivize combat, really incentivize mm -hmm. any kind of offensive capabilities, shooting your, uh, your classmates or anything like that. There might be competitive reasons to do it, but there's no score based for it other than maybe Asteroid Miner. Oh, and the combat exercise. And the combat exercise, right. Uh, but Discovery Quest, we made a point of not only not incentivizing uh, combat, but there's really no advantage to it. It's not a zero sum sort of game. It's not an a situation where you can take points from an opponent by shooting them down or anything like that. The only advantage to shooting an opponent in that game would be just to slow down their progress. So we really got away from that aspect of it. It's enough. <laughs> uh, well, it's enough sometimes, but we wanted to you know, make sure those who were, wouldn't be as into a combat simulation would still be engaged with this, and that's yeah. where we went there. We typically only see a handful of our students anyway exploring that route. Um, I mean, earlier on, they might just like, ooh, I can fire torpedoes and fire a whole slew, you know, but uh, there's capabilities to just to disable those commands in the system as well. So We turn off troll mode the first couple weeks <laughs> so that nobody tries to do that. Uh, so a little bit about how we use this in class. We designed it, as we mentioned, for the time between the AP exam, which is of course early May, and the end of school, which for us is first or second week of June. So we generally had somewhere between four and six weeks. Uh, and we, you know, the sense was that's too long to let the students just sit around and do nothing as much as they might like to. 
So we needed something to fill the time. The first year I taught my AP class, I was working with another partner teacher other than Michael, and we, we knew this was coming, so we actually polled the students. What would you like to do after the AP exam? And there was a very popular response for learning about networking. So we built up this whole networking unit. We built uh, assignments. We built lectures. We built activities. The AP exam came and went. We got into us and nothing. The students who had been so excited about learning about networking months ago no longer wanted to do anything because it was an interesting topic to them in theory, but it was not engaging for them at the end of the year. So for our second year, when Michael and I started working together, uh, we came up with this, which was we kind of tricked the students into learning things uh, by playing a game. It's a very active learning sort of thing. Uh, the way this works, as we said, designed for three to five, four to six weeks, but it can be stretched or shrunk to fit your needs. Uh, the first couple days are just your setup. It's getting everybody connected. There, are, there is a little bit of trickiness in the technical aspects of getting all the clients, all the students to connect to the server for the first time. But the good news is once you do it once, it's pretty much done. Then it's just a plug and play depending on what your IDE looks like from there on out. So we usually spend this first day, we make sure we've got everybody's attention. We do a full walkthrough, make sure they set everything up. And then we don't have to worry about it anymore. So that's the first day or two. And we'll cover a little bit about what that looks like at the yeah. end of this. Uh, the other thing we like to do is we like to do a sort of fun introduction. We show a YouTube video uh, before we tell them what's going on. Just uh, dead cold, call, cold start at the beginning of the class. We used to show the opening credits to Star Trek, the original series. And in the last couple of years, we switched over and we show the clip from the Lego movie when Benny the Spaceman finally gets to build his spaceship. And then we tell them that they are going to be building their own spaceships and they tend to get very excited by this. Uh, so that's first couple days from there. Our first kind of unit within the curriculum is learning basic navigation, just how to thrust, how to break, how to deal with the fact that there is no friction in space, that this is not like a car where you have to constantly push the accelerator to keep going, but just a little bit of thrust and you start moving, um, managing the fact that you could be pointed in a different direction than you're moving and keeping track of all those sorts of things. Uh, and we use generally find the middle, occasionally shapes in space uh, as our culminating competition for that unit. That's three to four days, depending on how much time you have in class, how quickly your students pick things up, things like that. Uh, from there, we move on to radar, which is really the crux of anything else. This is the most complicated piece of the system, and it's also the one that's going to be kind of least familiar to the students. So we spend about a week just working on getting them used to using their radar, picking up the scan results, reacting to those, understanding that it's not real-time updates, that they're getting a snapshot of the universe at whatever particular time they use their radar, and things can change and all that sort of thing. Um, like we said, about a week there, there are a number of competitions we can use for that. Asteroid Miner works well because you're just detecting the asteroids and shooting them down. Hungry Hungry Bobbles is we've got those little colored balls that we call bobbles. They're detecting them and then going to pick them up. And we have a modified version of our Discovery Quest game that we're working on, which strips away all the complexity and really just gets down to go find things and go scan them. Uh, so a similar sort of just radar and then go do what you're looking for. After radar, we move into object avoidance where we are learning how to not only detect things, but to actually get around them. So for these first two units, we have the capability to turn off collisions, turn off gravity, turn off all of these things in the universe that would get in the way of the ships doing what they want to do so they can just learn how to operate them. For unit three here, we turn all that back on, and all of a sudden, everybody's flying headlong into planets and asteroids and other such things. So we give them some time to learn, not now that they know how to detect what's around them, learn how to react to that really well, learn how to do avoidance, learn how to stop when necessary, learn how to turn, um, not just rotate, but maybe steer out of the way, all these sorts of things. Survivor Alerts works really well for that. Just stay alive as long as you can. Dragon Slayer, a more advanced version where we overpopulate the world with dragons. And the nice thing there is for Survivor, you can sometimes find this nice safe little patch of the universe where there's nothing that will come get you. Uh, in Dragon Slayer, there are dragons. They will hunt you down and they will eat you. So the students have to actually be a little more active with their working there. Uh, and then at that point, we get into whatever our final competition is going to be for the year. We usually try to make it about at least two weeks. We find that that's kind of the minimum amount of time necessary for students really to be able to iterate on a strategy for these large scale competitions and come to something that they pretty, feel pretty happy about and they're going to be successful with. Uh, as the, since we own the platform, we've developed a new game for ourselves every year. Um, we, we, those were kind of the advanced games that Michael explained previously, um, but you can use any of those. You can also use any of the simpler games as a final competition if that's the way you want to go. There's nothing special about that other than what we do a larger stretch of um, development for the students on it and then because of our association with the Teals program one of the things they do is they donate prizes that we're able to give away to our students. So the last few years we've actually been able to give away either an Xbox or a laptop 
to one lucky student from our classes uh, by virtue of being the grand champion of our space battle competition. So they get pretty excited when we tell them that as well. Right, and so with all the competitions, uh, a lot of this stuff is configurable. You can put planets, you can remove planets. So you know, earlier on you might do a challenge where, like we said, we turn off the gravity. There's nothing that can, you know, they have to worry about um, hitting into right away. And then for your final competition, you can turn all that back on, really tweak those knobs to see what, you know, students are, uh, are capable of handling. And, uh, and really have that good final competition. Yeah. And the, um, the last thing I wanted to mention too was that if you are on a shorter timeline for three weeks, you can really cut out one of those intermediate competitions or the final competition, just kind of ramp up one of the, the challenges a little bit more yeah, and still have a cohesive. The thing kind of scaffolds nicely from one unit to the next, but there are ways to differentiate it if you have a different timeline that you need to work with. So that's kind of the macro view. Within each of those units, it's really nice. Day one is, for any unit, is introducing whatever's new uh, for that unit, whether it's a new set of commands, a new uh, aspect of the environment, new celestial bodies, whatever it may be. We actually make a point on this first day of not going into a ton of detail here, because one of the things we're trying to get our students to do with this is to get used to working in an unfamiliar environment, dealing with third-party libraries that they don't have control over, learning to read documentation, do research, try things out. Um, and so we make a point of not going into a ton of detail about this is how it works, this is what it does, this is how you use it, but we just kind of say, here are these new things you can do. You can now fire torpedoes, you can warp, and you can cloak. Go look them up. And we make them kind of experiment and figure it all out so they get that uh, active learning piece of it. Yeah, we'll um, touch a little bit of a base on like, okay, warp lets you do this and, you know, cloaking lets you do this, but, you know, all this stuff is documented and just like a real engineer has to do every day, they have to go and, you know, read that documentation, understand it, they can ask us questions, but, you know, we really try and get them to be as hands-on as possible. Yeah, if it's, uh, if it's something that's really, really unique or if it's um, a class that's maybe been struggling a little bit more, we might do a little bit of a code along and a walk through on that first day to get them used to it, but we like to be hands-off as much as we can. Uh, and then after that point, at the, at the, once we're done with that on the first day and for all subsequent days in the unit, it's come in, start the server, project space at the front of the classroom, and off the students go. It's really low impact for the teacher. Uh, we spend our time wandering around the room, seeing how the students are doing, answering some questions, maybe providing some advice on strategy. Uh, if it's a really self-sufficient class, we'll build our own ships and drop them in and, and let them compete with us, which they always enjoy because they tend to do better since they've been working on it for weeks and we do it in about 10 minutes. Um, but you know, it's, a, it's really, it's low impact for us as the instructors and it's just an opportunity for us to let the students run, engage in this active learning where they're in control of everything. Um, they can iterate on their own cycle, on their own timeline, the way the system's set up when we've got space running up front. They can connect, they can run their ship, they can see what it does when they've gotten the information they need. They disconnect, they go back to their seat, they make any changes they wanna make and then they reconnect and try it again. And they can do this as often as they want, as many times as they want, so they're kind of completely completely in control of their development plan and their cycle, and they're getting to own their experience of getting from the beginning to whatever the end goal is. Yeah. And while they're up there, they're seeing what their other students are doing, the strategies that they're taking, and they get inspired by that, right? Like, oh, that's really neat. I didn't think of doing it that way. So it really kind of brings the class together on this kind of shared problem, like how do we engage and how do we figure out how to succeed? Yeah. Uh, we do have lesson plans written for the first few units. We're working on some more. We're also revising the early ones. So there's a little bit of uh, formal lesson plan there, but a lot more on the way, hopefully. We, um, we generally don't do a lot of formal lessons. We don't do lectures. We don't really necessarily directly tie this into topics. We just kind of let it be an exploratory environment for the students. Uh, but some of our partner schools have chosen to do some more structured lessons around some things when they're using this platform. And these are just a few of the topics we've seen them do there. Obviously, there's lots of computational thinking and algorithmic development going on. Uh, it's a lot of students' first introduction to real-time systems, so dealing with the fact that uh, there can be lag in the systems. A lot of things become non-deterministic because you don't have full control over the whole environment. So running the same set of commands twice in a row in the system might not get you the same result because there's other factors at play. Uh, it's event-driven programming, so rather than having single entry, single exit, one main method that runs top to bottom, 
Now, for the first time, they have to deal with the fact that they're not in control of everything. Their method gets called when the server decides it's time for the method to get called. Uh, and they have to kind of take stock of what's going on at that point and learn to be more reactive versus proactive in their programming, which is new for a lot of them. Right. And also storing all that information that they want to remember for the next time that their ship mm -hmm. needs to do something. Yeah. Um, finite state machines are a really big concept in theoretical computer science. They're kind of the abstract model of any computer or any com computational system out there. And what the students are really building in their ships is a very small finite state machine. So we've seen a couple of schools do a really nice set of lectures and um, conversations about the concept of finite state machines and how those work and getting the students to think about programming their ships in that way, um, which really helps them structure their algorithms a little bit better. Um, and that's a really cool introduction to a topic you don't see in a lot of high school computer science courses. And then, of course, you can get into the networking protocols if you want to talk about how the client and the server are communicating. And this is really all one big giant artificial intelligence simulation. So you can get into that and decision-making trees and um, probabilistic decision-making if you want to go that way and all these other sorts of things. So lots of opportunities to tie it into very real computer science topics that don't often make it into a high school course, even the advanced ones. Right. And with a lot of these things, you don't have to obviously go into the nitty-gritty or be teaching the students how to do these things, but it's great conversation points to bring up and say, like, all this stuff that you've been doing and, you know, learning on your own to, to start, you know, wetting your feet on, like, it ties into major branches of computer science that you can go study in the future. Uh, so we're going to keep moving. We're running a little tighter on time. Um, the, the, the senioritis notion here. So, whoops, sorry. For those who might not be familiar with the concept, students like to check out at the end of the school year, especially seniors and especially in an AP class after the AP exam. A lot of them, they see the exam as the culmination. They go, that's it. I'm done. I've earned it. I'm out. Uh, and in, you know, if it, for, for us, at least, if it were a week after the AP exam, I'd at least be comfortable letting them say, yeah, you know what, you've earned it, you guys have worked hard, that's great. But at four, five, six weeks, that's too long for my taste to let them sit around. So we needed something to keep them engaged. And that's where kind of space battle came from. The things we've seen, uh, the new API and the fact that it's very research-based, the fact that we're not hand-feeding them, we're not just walking them through everybody building the same program, but actually giving them the creativity and the openness to go about this however they see it really drives their curiosity, uh, their ingenuity. It gives them a chance to express themselves in the way they write their programs. The shared environment and the competition creates a nice competitive drive. They want to one-up their classmates. They want to one-up themselves. They want to beat us if we put our own ships in there. And of course, having those prizes donated from Teals gives them a, a something actually tangible that they can drive for there. Um, and it pr provides some cross-curricular connections. It's a realistic physics simulation. And so a lot of them get an opportunity to apply some of the equations they've learned in physics or in calculus or in trigonometry for uh, designing the maneuvers they're going to do with their ships, figuring out the trajectories of the various objects, such like that. Uh, it's not necessary. We've had students who haven't, haven't reached that level of math still be very successful with a more trial and error type of approach. But those who have seen it have a chance to apply it. Um, and it also has this neat little side effect of helping them realize that you know, the equations you learn in physics class are great in an ideal physics classroom environment, but don't necessarily apply strictly in a more realistic environment. And so they have to deal with this. I did all the calculations. I'm supposed to I thrust until halfway. Then I break halfway. Why am I not getting to exactly the right point? And well, because there are other things at play here. Um, and most importantly here, we haven't collected a ton of data on this, but anecdotally, both in our classrooms and the other schools that have picked this up, the engagement that we see is not strictly any particular subset or demographic. It's not just the boys. It's not just the A students. It's not just the seniors. We've seen kind of across our whole classroom people getting engaged, boys and girls. Um, we've seen students who have struggled during AP computer science during the course of the curriculum really see this as an opportunity to start fresh. It's a brand new paradigm. Everybody's on even footing. Uh, and while they often won't be able to completely overtake their counterparts who might have done a little bit better, they can really perform well, despite the fact that they might have struggled with some of the material earlier in the year. Um, we do provide, we do give grades on these assignments. Usually we do it strictly objectively. We set bars for how many points you have to score on our final challenge for a B or a B plus or so on and so on. Uh, for that, and uh, we do it in such a way that if the students are in class and working on this for all the time that we give them, they should be able to get a pretty good grade by the end of it, which is a nice morale boost for them at the end of the year uh, as well. So it's a, it's a, it's worked really well for us keeping everybody or most everybody 
engaged regardless of any other factors that may be at play there. Yeah, and even though it's a virtual environment simulated of space, like it applies directly to all the stuff that's going on. It's trying to explore Mars and you know, students get excited about you know, thinking about how what they've learned in class all year actually applies to all those different areas of real world challenges. Yeah, we did survey some of our students this year. Um, these are a few of the choice pull quotes and just uh, some things that the students have said about their experience. And you can see that these particular students really felt, you know, it was a way to keep engaged. It built up and allowed them to put all the skills they learned all year long into one big application, which is something kind of unique. A lot of the time in a computer science class, it's one topic at a time, and you never really get the chance to put it all together. And this was a, an opportunity for them to do that there. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's a fun thing. We've tricked them into learning, as active learning often, often does. Uh, it's really interesting. We actually got one respondent who said, I was really upset that you made me work so hard after the AP exam. I don't understand. And we're sitting here. Our first reaction was, oh, let's do that. And then we said, no, wait. That was the point. You learned something. You just hated it because we made you work to learn. So um, we've had, again, anecdotally, we haven't collected a ton of data on this yet, but really good experiences from the vast majority of our students. So basically, we're going to go into a little bit about you know, what's required to get this going in your classroom. Uh, everything that we are, have been talking about, um, all the challenges, everything is basically up on the GitHub website, and we update that as we you know, add more things. Um, so you know, it's a, a breadth of resources about this project there. Uh, we have some of the sample curriculums there. We're going to be putting some more of those up there. Um, but in terms of you know, just getting started from day one, uh, from the student's side, it's two JAR dependencies. So if you've already imported some library in the past uh, for some other project you're doing, there's not, not going to be anything different there. If this is your first time you know, introducing students to a third party library that they have to add to their class path, that kind of goes into the little bit of extra setup that uh, Brett mentioned earlier where you know you're gonna have to spend a little bit of time walking the students how they go find their IDE you know Eclipse, JGrasp, uh, BlueJ, whatever you happen to use and, and include those jars and we have some instructions for you know our project specifically and a few IDEs up on the, the website as well um, and then to get started for the students it's really uh, they need basically 12 lines to write their uh, abstract base class um, extension to to get a ship connected to the world and so we'll show that here in a second um, from your side as the teacher, um, right now the GitHub build is basically a Windows executable that just, you know, you download it, you unzip it, you run it, uh, it'll probably ask you to open a port on the firewall, um, and, but after that you're pretty much good to go. Um, there's a whole bunch of configuration files in there, so you'll want to probably go to the command prompt to use those, uh, we'll show you that. Um, theoretically, Mac and Linux should run from the source since it's built in Python, it's using cross-platform libraries. Uh, we just are not, you know, plugged into those environments, so we we're, haven't. We're Windows people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if you're interested in being our Mac or Linux guinea pig, please feel free to let us know. We'd be happy to set you up with everything and have you try to run it and help you debug what's going on, so we can build this out for those environments as well. Um, and then, uh, in terms of networking, it's usually best uh, we say if everyone's on the same subnet. So that really means you know everyone's using the wired connection or everyone's using wireless. Um, depending on your school setup, this is where you want to talk to your IT guys a bit uh, because sometimes schools, if you're you know on the Wi-Fi and then on the wired, they go through different hardwares and then that, those hardware um, routers will block the packets going back and forth, so they can't actually connect to the teacher's machine at the front. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a few little things here. We communicate over an arbitrary port. That port is actually configurable. Uh, we pick one at random, but you can change it if you need to. So you want to check and make sure your school's firewall doesn't block any non-known port traffic or see if you can get that open. Um, you're running a new network protocol. So there are a few little things you'll have to work with the IT folks on, uh, but it's nothing terribly complicated. It's nothing they probably shouldn't be able to handle if you give them a little bit of notice. Uh, the other piece of it is some of that student set up the jars and all that. You'll want to get that set up ahead of time. We like to put the jars on a network share and have the students constantly reference the network share rather than downloading them to their computers so that if we need to make updates, we can just drop the new version of the jar on that share and the students don't have to change anything. It's completely transparent to them uh, what's going on. If we make any breaking changes, we of course inform them of that, but they don't have to worry about updating their dependencies every time we need to, we fix a bug or we find some new feature we're gonna add or anything like that. Right. Uh, so this is basically your preliminary spaceship uh, we do some imports at the top, we give it a name, we're extending that abstract base class I've been talking about. 
Uh, we have our main method, which basically just calls into the library. Uh, in the past, we, we you know, set up the IDE to just call the library, but that was a little bit more complicated, so we streamlined this. And you're basically just passing the IP address to the server machine, which we display on the server itself. So it's pretty easy for students to just type that number in, get connected. Uh, and then you're putting in your class name there um, to, to pass into the, the library. From there, um, basically the first thing before we get into this repeating loop that I talked about earlier that the students, you know, shift is trying to get a command, processing, etc. The first thing the server does is say, hey, tell me about your ship, right? What is going on? So the students get to name their ship, how it appears up in the, in the world. They get to pick a color. Uh, so that's all their text related to their ship appears in that color. So they can personalize it a bit. Uh, and then we have different images for the ships that they can pick. That's the integer at the end. And then finally, you get into the main loop of, you know, hey, what do you want to do? What is your command? You get some information about the environment, and you just pass back a command based on whatever logic you want. And what's nice about this, this is extremely boilerplate. So when you build a new ship or when each individual student changes their ship, um, really the only things that are going to change, they might name their class something different, so these will change. Uh, they can name their ship whatever they want, they can pick their color and their uh, image, and then of course they're going to have whatever their algorithm is going on inside this get next command method. But the bulk of this is boilerplate, so that's why once we get them going on that first day, they can just copy this over and change what's going on in here uh, for any future missions or any time they want to make changes. They don't have to rebuild the whole thing from, from scratch every time. So I think what we want to do now is we want to actually kind of show you this live in action. What we're going to do, I'm going to bring up the server here on my machine up front, and uh, Michael on his laptop is going to run a ship that he's built, so you can kind of get a sense of what this looks like. Uh, we do, as we said, oops, I need to show you my screen here. We do, as we said, run this from the command line, so if that's something that you or your students aren't as familiar with, it'll take a little bit of getting used to. It's not complicated. Um, basically, once you've downloaded everything, there's an XE that you run, and then you're going to pass to it uh, a set of configuration files. You can pass more than one. It does a pretty good job of merging all the, um, the options that way. Our configuration file looks like this. You don't need to get into all the details here, but it's kind of this one is one we built for this talk. It's specifying the resolution of my screen. It's specifying how big I want the world to be in relation to the resolution of the screen. And then I'm dropping a whole bunch of celestial objects in here. Uh, this is all documented on our website. You can modify this as much as you like. But we also ship with a whole bunch of prepackaged configuration files. So you can stay out of here completely if you want to. You can just run with any of the config files we give you. We have a default one for each of the competitions and from several different machine setups you might have. Yeah, most of the lesson plans will say these are the configuration files that we use and those are actually included in the package that you download. So. so once I've got all that, I run it. This is space. This is space battle. You can see we've got all of our different celestial objects in there. We've got planets, nebulas, black dragons, black holes. Um, we also have a bunch of controls on the server side when you're running this. The, probably the single most useful one is that. We can display the IP address of the server right on top there, so students are never going to go, I forgot what IP address it is. All right, it's just right there. There's no excuse. Big white numbers at the top of the screen. Yeah. And typically, that doesn't change too often. So you know, you just have to notice, like, oh, it's changed today. But you know, that maybe yeah. happens a couple of times. If you get a lot of students all of a sudden not able to connect, your IP address probably changed. Yeah. Um, you want to go ahead and yeah, get so, connected there? Yep. So you'll see separate computers here, right, as Michael puts this up. His ship has dropped in the world. There it is. His ship is called Ship, very creative. Uh, right now it's just kind of flying around in circles. So we can, uh, we've can, we got this. You'll notice I zoomed in there. My world is currently one and a half times on, in, each in each dimension, excuse me, uh, the resolution of my screen. So the default view is kind of zoomed out where I see everything. We can also zoom in, get a little bit of a close-up view. Uh, up here in the upper right, it's showing us all of the ships that are connected. Uh, these zeros here, I don't know how well you can see them from out there. That would be the scores if we were running a competition. We're just running a bare simulation right now, so nothing interesting there. Uh, we can track an individual ship. So this is useful if your students aren't sure what's going on. We've got that little heads up view in the lower right there. So it's showing us the vital statistics of the ship and also the list of commands that it's executing right now. Uh, this is really handy if your students if they don't see the ship doing what they think it should be doing and they haven't put any print lens in their code to actually debug what's happening. You can do it for them. Michael just ran into a planet. Yep, you can see it's rotating, thrusting, various intervals. Um, and since I'm doing multiple commands at the same time, I'm running out of energy. So Yeah, we have, um, we have what we call our god modes. So you can actually add celestial objects into the world with a few clicks. 
Uh, so I can put a new planet there. I can add some asteroids. I can say, you know what? You got it too easy over here. I'm going to add a dragon. Uh, the dragon didn't get close enough, so I'm going to pick up Michael's ship. I'm actually going to move him right in front of the dragon. And now the dragon will eat him. Uh, generally, obviously, we don't use these during the competitions, but for training purposes, it's really handy. Uh, you noticed also as we're tracking the ship and zoomed in, when he got destroyed by the dragon, he respawned elsewhere, and the camera jumped to follow him. Yeah. Uh, so when you're tracking a ship, it will actually follow yeah. like that. And again, you don't have to use all of these environmental things. You can mm -hmm. you know, build them in slowly to as you're doing different competitions. Every one of these celestial objects has different properties that mm -hmm. you know, the students can intera interact with. Planets have gravity. So if we turn on uh, yeah, debug mode. I can remove mode. things. If I turn on debug mode, uh, you can see this is very busy. You don't want it on often. But this is giving you a whole bunch more information about what's going on with the simulation. Those blue circles are the gravity wells of the planets and the stars and the black holes. Uh, so you can really see what's going on there and you can tell, you help your students figure out if they're actually caught in gravity or not. Yeah. The yellow ring is the radar range. So you know that my ship right now might be seeing the nebula. It's not quite seeing the black hole. Um, because it's just out of range. Now I'm going to pick up the black hole. And in, if um, you really want to geek out, we have log mode where it spits out all the stuff that the server is doing. Uh, we mostly use this for debugging actual issues on our end, um, but it's uh, not recommended except as a power user feature. Uh, I mean, what else is there? We've got, um, I show that you can move things. You can actually remove things from the world. So he's caught in a black hole. I feel bad for him. I'm going to get rid of the black hole. So he doesn't have to deal with that. Now he's going to get eaten by another dragon. And just for fun, you can send things hurtling through space by creating an explosion force. Yeah, that's what we used to do before we had Find the Middle uh, programmed in to automatically send students back once they found the middle to kind of yeah, get them. Yeah, we get them in the middle and we blow everything up and send them flying again and see if they could get back. Yeah. Get supernova? Uh, we do not. We just have we have stars here, but we don't have the stars exploding in any interesting ways. Yeah. So again, that's a whole lot of features. You don't have to touch any of that if you don't want to. You can just run the game and let it be. Um, but there is all this customizability and configurability depending on what exactly right. you want to be doing. It really kind of lets you target specifically to you know your range of students um, yeah. and then how you know how quickly they ramp up. If you have a classroom of really advanced, capable students, you know you can really go all the way out uh, to the college level type style difficulty if you and need to. And real quick, disconnect and sh uh, do ship four instead of ship zero. I think it's ship four. So we have a number of different sprites for the ship. They're oh. purely aesthetic, doesn't make a difference, and actually many of them have been created by our students. They see this and they're like, I want a ship that looks like whatever, and so we give them the specs for our sprite sheet, and they actually go off and create a new sprite sheet and we integrate Outside those of class. In. Outside of class time, yeah. Uh, if this one is the one I think it is, Oh, it's not the one I think it is. That's a, it's a ship from StarCraft. I believe that's a Protoss ship of some kind. I'm looking for, we got the TARDIS in there. We've got the USS Enterprise in there. We've got the Millennium Falcon in there. Um, so all of these things that the students have decided they wanted in the game and they built out for us. Uh, did you do another one? No, I don't okay. think so. So that's, uh, that's kind of our live demo. And I think that's pretty much what we wanted to take you through. So we're happy to take any questions. Uh, once again, oops, I should go out of presenter mode. This is what happens when you all tab. Yeah, so that's our website. That's where all of the bat Space Battle stuff is located. And also Michael's website, uh, the ISSI comp side, that's my class website and Mathilde's website. If you're interested in any of that. And yes, hi. We are in 22 states, um, so it's not it's not you know pervasive, but we are all over the place. Um, we are always looking to expand. We're kind of shut down with our recruiting for 16, 17 at this point. But uh, if it's something you're interested in, I can certainly talk to you afterwards. Yeah, um, get the jump on 17, get 18. Get you in touch with the right people to get started with the process for 17, 18. Yeah, we are. Um, we have 13 regional managers for Teals right now in something like eight or nine different cities um, and they, they cover wide geographic areas. Like we have a regional manager based in Atlanta but she also covers Alabama and Florida and the rest of Georgia. We have one in Texas but he's also covering a lot of the Midwest where we have presences there. So um, we're, we're in a lot of different places and we're looking to add some more.